All right, if you take your Bible and turn to the book of Galatians and go to chapter 5. Now, I spent a good bit of time last week laying the foundation for chapter 5, and I'm going to allude back to that thought just as we go through this. And again, the idea, and I'm not going to be nearly as elaborate, but just to, to bring down to the bottom of the, of the illustration, essentially, a person can be in bondage to the law. They can be in bondage to their sin. Now, technically, all of us are in bondage to our sin apart from Christ, but the difference is the person under the law probably doesn't recognize it. Uh, he thinks, I'm keeping these laws, I'm keeping these rules, and especially in the context of the New Testament, this would have been the Jews who were under this law, and they, of course, looked to that law as a system that they believed made them superior, that they believed made them a little closer to God than anyone else. And had they kept it, sure, they'd have been closer to God, but they didn't recognize their neglect of even keeping the law. They changed the rules of the law. They simply made the law fit their lifestyle, so they were in bondage to that law. And on the other hand, those that were Galatians, they were in bondage to their sin. They wouldn't know much about the law. So both saved the Jews that got saved and the Galatians that were simply heathen Gentiles that got saved, they were delivered from that realm of bondage. And we, of course, use the analogy of an internment camp. The, the gates were taken down, and they both entered into the same area of liberty. Now, those gates were taken down. If they chose to, to go back into where they were in bondage, they, they could have done that, but who would? Who would want to do that? Um, what would make you want to go back to a place of bondage when you've been set free? And then they may have looked over at the other internment camp of bondage, perhaps to the law, had they been in the one of sin, and they might think, well, I'd like to go try that for a while. But why? Why would you step back into bondage when you've been set free? And that's the argument that Paul makes to these Galatians. That's what he's telling them. Now, they did. They listened to the, to the voice of these Judaizers who came in. And, you know, you, you catch a new believer when he's, when he's trying to grow and his heart is open. And, and there's a good side to this. The side is, as a believer is open, he's saved. What do I do next? What do I need to do to please God? What do I need to do to step up in my spiritual life? And, you know, it's a shame that we don't keep that hunger uh, often when we've been saved for years because that hunger leads us to grow. Now, if our hunger leads us to God's Word, we will grow. If our hunger leads us to listen to a man, we're going to be caught up in bondage. You know, that's why false religions, they, they don't reach anybody themselves. They go try to get those that have been reached by gospel-preaching churches and bring them in and try to reinform them to, to get what they get. Um, charismatic churches are full of people that were exposed to the gospel from somebody else, but they found out, oh, there's something more than I need. I, I need the full gospel, or I need to have this experience of speaking in tongues or some kind of a supernatural, sensational type thing. But what do you need more than what we pointed out last week in John chapter 8 where he said, rivers of living water shall flow from your belly. I mean, what can I have that's a higher experience than when Jesus said, when I come in, you're going to have rivers of living water flowing out of you. Now that is liberty. Why would I want to leave the living waters to go back to a stagnant swamp? Now there is a part of me that sometimes wants to go back to the stagnant swamp. And that's the old flesh. There's no doubt this flesh just can't get the affinity for the life of liberty. But the spirit can. Now, Paul knows the Holy Spirit lives inside of these believers. And he appeals to the part of them that he knows is in there. And you know, if you said this to a lost man, he wouldn't get it. If you said it to a lost man, apart from the, the Holy Spirit making it real to him, he, he wouldn't realize, why would I want this? Because he can't see that he's in bondage to sin. He doesn't understand it until the Spirit of God provokes his heart and he sees, hey, this, this is sin as my slave master. Now, people get sick of their sin. They get tired of reaping. They get tired of the consequences, but it takes the power of this book and the power of the Holy Spirit for them to see it and say, wait a minute, it is the sin that's the problem. I'm the problem, and here's the help that I need. Now, you look in chapter 5, and of course it starts off again, stand fast, therefore in the liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now, I spend a lot of time here because there's so much misunderstanding on this idea of liberty. 
Obviously, what he's saying to these believers is, you have gotten the liberty. Stay in it. Don't go back. So what does that mean? That means that I could actually have been liberated by being saved, but not enjoy the liberty that God gave me. Now, it's kind of interesting. I'm delivered from my sin. And yet some would claim that the liberty is a liberty to sin. Why would I be liberated from my sin so I can sin? I already did that when I was lost. I have been liberated from the pit of sin. Now I have an ability to do something I could not have done as a lost man. I have the ability to live right. Can't do it in my own power and strength. I mean, if we uh, preach some, some ideals from the Bible to say, look, I'm a Christian. God is concerned about my testimony. God is concerned about how I talk. God is concerned about where I go. God is concerned about the habits that I have. He's concerned about what occupies my mind. He's concerned about the words that come out of my mouth. You know, someone says, oh, well, then you're a legalist. I'm not saying that if I say certain words or if I think certain thoughts or I do certain things that the doing of those things makes me closer to God. I'm saying that the desire I have to be closer to God and to do whatever pleases Him causes me to do those things. That makes me want to do right. And now I've been liberated to actually do it. Now, those that really often are wrong on this idea of liberty is they are basically saying now, uh, well, you know, you're saved. Absolutely secure in Christ. You are. That's true. And now that you're saved, nobody can really tell you that this is wrong or that is wrong. And if you have any kind of desire to live holy or you believe in standards or believe in living apart from the world, oh, well, that's legalism, like it's the opposite of liberty. Well, you know, technically, I'm saved. I guess I can do anything I want to do. That's not going to make me lost, but I'll tell you what I want to do. I don't always do it, but I want to please God. I find something in this book that gives me the impression God would be pleased by that. By God's grace, I want to do it. Don't always accomplish it. Sometimes I fail to do what I know He doesn't want me to do, but I don't scream, well, I've got liberty. Thank God. That didn't displease God at all. No, I find that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Does that mean He doesn't love me anymore? Does that mean I've been plucked out of the Father's hand? Does that mean I've got to start over? No, it means that my Father has an issue with me i got to get rid of my, i got a family problem now. I'm in the family, but we've got some things we need to take care of. And so the liberty, if you look at it in this sense, I have been liberated now to have victory in my life. That's, the potential is there. Now, he tells us in these, these uh, uh, Galatians obviously had missed this, and they missed it religiously. Now, you'll notice in verse 2, Paul says, I say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, the circumcision obviously was the sign of the covenant. A Jew had to have some type of a physical uh, sign that he was part of the Jewish religion. And that was the circumcision. I mean, you can keep the law, you won't keep all the feast days, but when you were a certain age, eight days old, they circumcised you if you were born a Jew. And if you were grown and you decided you want to become a Jew, you didn't just start attending the synagogue circumcision was the sign of the covenant. And of course, it, it, that's what they did. And so Paul uses that term as an encompassing term of the Jewish ceremonial system. He says, if you are circumcised, and you know what, some of these Jews, or Galatians rather, they had no clue about, they were Gentiles, they were heathen. And these Jews had come in and said, look, if you want to be a perfected Christian now, I mean, you know Jesus is the Messiah. You know he was a Jew, didn't you? You know that he was promised to, to come through the Jews and, and the Old Testament and all these promises, and now you're trying to be a Christian. If you want to be a good Christian, you've got to become part of the Jewish system. And these uh, believers, they should have listened to Paul. They should have known better, but they got a little bit confused, and they said, okay, what do I need to do? Well, you need to go through this rite of circumcision. You do that, and you'll be part of us. And you know what? There are plenty of false religions that if you can just... Uh, do some rite, some ceremony, whatever it might be, you're part of them. Well, he says, if you do that, if you got to get circumcised to be right with God, why did Jesus need to die? Why didn't he just let folks get circumcised and they'd have been fine? He says, Christ will profit you nothing. 
Now, the language he's using, he's not saying that all of a sudden now Christ is no prophet. He's not the problem. But he's laying the argument that if that's what you're depending on, why did Jesus even need to die for you? So, of course, the argument's obvious. I testify in verse 3 again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to the whole law. I mean, all these Jews were preaching is we just want proselytes. We'll just get these folks to come in. I mean, yeah, Paul reached them. But we're going to come in and make them perfected Jews. How many folks did we get as part of us today? Uh, oh, we got this many. And, and, and they went through this rite, this circumcision. And he says, wait a minute now. What I just taught you in the previous chapters, I say to you again, if you want to, the circumcision, and you're counting on that, and if that's what your Christianity is, then you don't just get circumcised. He said, let me lay out about 513 other laws that you've got to keep. Are you going to keep all of those too and not miss one of them? Of course not. He says you're a debtor to all of it. Paul is not negating that God's law was holy and just and that uh, he wasn't demeaning even the ceremonial side nor the moral side of the law. He was just saying the law had a purpose for a time. Why are you trying to jump back into it? Now, we probably don't do that today. And again, some people have said, okay, anybody who looks back and says, well, you know, uh, you try to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, you know, most of the Ten Commandments, even folks who have, are loose on standards think most of those are still in, in play. But if I go to some other places in the law and I find out what pleases God, some things that don't please God, um, if anything was an abomination to God, it still is. But I'm not keeping the law to get me closer to God. I'm allowing the Spirit of God to work in my heart, and I'm trying to just listen to what God has to say in this book. It's completely different. Now, they were trying to keep the law, so in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, some of the Galatians were saved and mixed up. Some of the people who lived in Galatia had gotten swept in, but they had listened only to the Jews. You know, here's somebody, their, their neighbor got saved. And they knew that that person was a Christian now. And it was, you'd be, take a stand to be a Christian in that day. You'd be persecuted, perhaps physically, certainly ridiculed. I mean, everybody worshipped idols in Galatia. I mean, that was just common. You had idols. It was an idolatrous place. And now these Christians had one God and no idols. And that was unusual. And here a neighbor looks over. They see the change. And they wonder, well, man, maybe there's something to this Christianity. And so maybe they started visiting with them in their church and came along with them and got interested. Well, these Jews came in and taught them circumcision and perverted the gospel. I go back to chapter 1. You don't need to turn there, but remember, if anybody preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, then let him be accursed. There were some folks who were going to be damned because of the heresy they were teaching. And he said, those of you who are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Now, that didn't mean genuinely saved people had started trusting the law and lost their salvation. That wasn't the idea. But the idea was, if you are trusting the law to be justified, if, if you've never been saved and you come to the law and think that's going to justify you, you don't have opportunity to have God's grace. Grace isn't open to somebody who keeps the law. You can't have it both ways. See, grace, the very essence of the term is unmerited. Whatever you're justified by, and whatever work it is, negates grace. God's not going to let you take any credit for it. You get to heaven and say, I'll tell you what, man, I was about as a disciplined a law keeper as you ever saw. Uh, you see what I did? Kept all these rules? Pat yourself on the back? You're not going to make it. If you get there in, in that analogy and, and get to heaven, you'll be, I'll tell you what, I deserve to be lost. I should have been in hell. I didn't do anything right, but God just mercifully and graciously reached down and saved me. To God be the glory. Now, they that are justified by the law, and in a sense, too, those that had been saved, and, and maybe were looking back at the law and thinking this will help kind of elevate my salvation, they, too, were fallen from grace. You know, they didn't lose their salvation. You don't. If falling from grace doesn't mean you do because I'm not going to lose my salvation. I'm in the hand of the Father. Nobody can pluck me out unto him that is able to keep me from falling. I mean, we could go down the line.
But what happens if a Christian, in a sense, falls from grace? You know, I don't just need grace to be saved. I need grace to live for God every day. And you know, it's true in a Christian's life, I got saved by grace. That is a, that is a transaction. That's a done deal. The Bible says my salvation is a standing. My daily living is a walk. The standing is that's settled. That's done, can't change. But my walk every day requires the same grace that it took to save me. And the moment I as a believer begin to turn salvation into a list of regulations, religious regulations, then I begin to depend on that. That's the law. I'm falling from grace. Now again, it seems like a fine line. There might be some regulations that are good. Church attendance is not only a good thing, it's commanded by God. It's, you know, if a person was a shut-in today and had no ability to come to church, now, maybe they have the internet and can watch it online, maybe they don't even have that. Maybe they uh, get visited by church members and they come encourage them, but they just cannot physically go to church. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Let me tell you that strict law, if we lived by the law, it doesn't matter if you're a shut-in or not. You'd better hire somebody to bring you. doesn't matter if you're a shut-in. Forsake not the assembling yourselves together. If we live by the law, God's not making any excuse for your physical condition. God's not giving you an excuse because it'd be too expensive for you to get here. He said, come. You didn't come. Well, you know what? I don't live by the law. I live by grace. You know what God's looking at? He's looking at my heart. Now, um, often people take that old passage out of 1 Samuel. You know, the Lord, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. You'll notice in that passage, you'll remember how it went. Samuel came up, and he was highly impressed with the first sons. Oh, surely the Lord's anointed is among us. Samuel thought, this is it. And God corrected him. Wait a minute, Samuel. He looks good, but I don't notice just the good on the outside. I want to see something on the inside. If you ever hear anybody use that verse to defend their low living, they use it the other way around. You look in their, the way they're living and you say, well, you know, the Bible says this. Obviously, the position you're in is not lining up with this book. Well, wait a minute, brother. Uh, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. What they're saying is, I don't look too good on the outside, but on the inside, I look good. God used it the other way. He said, you look good on the outside, but inside's what I'm seeing. It's, it's different. Now, that's true here. If I was strictly according to law, and I'm not wanting grace, I'm gonna, here's how I grow. I keep a list of rules. I go to church. Well, what happens if you couldn't go to church? God's more concerned about, would you go to church? That's the heart, isn't it? It's not the physical act that pleased God. It's what you wanted to do if you could do. On the other hand, here's some teenager. He comes every Sunday. He's more faithful than the steeple. Why? His mom made him go. He's got to sit there. He's miserable when he gets there, miserable why he's there, and miserable until he gets out of the parking lot and goes home. Now, he was there. Did he please God? No, the physical act didn't please God. Hey, we live by grace. We're not saying that there's some ceremonial law. But what about the person? You say, okay, well, there you go. Here's somebody who didn't go to church. They please God. Here's somebody did, and they didn't please God. Therefore, you can please God without going to church. I won't go either. Well, you see, what you've missed, the point is, why don't you want to go? What's missing? It's not the physical act. It's what's missing. Now, all of us have a side of us, a flesh, that wakes up on Sunday morning sometime, and we thought, boy, I if, just, if I just had another 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, um, I'd really rather lay here. The old flesh will tell you to lay there. There's no doubt. What is it that got you up? Well, what it was that got you up, that's what the grace of God can cultivate, the Holy Spirit of God. Your spirit being led by His Spirit, that's what the grace of God will work. And it'll win if we give, it, if we give ourselves to God through His grace. Now, in the, with that in mind, knowing that's the case, notice the warning that Paul now gives. He shows us that the liberty is there, but then notice what hinders our liberty. Now, in verse 5, if we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. 
you know, again, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but this is, he's just, Paul is, so I'll just match him. He says again, circumcision doesn't avail. Uncircumcision doesn't avail. The religious activity is not what's concerned, but faith, which worketh by love. It's something that God is doing in me that produces this. You know what happened? And when these Galatians got genuinely saved, they were walking with God. If God wanted them to go through a physical act like the Jews, they'd have done it. But what he was saying is it's not whether you did or didn't. That ain't even an issue. The issue is it's, that didn't help anything. It didn't hurt anything. But if you depended on it, it hurt something. It caused a problem if you're depending on it. Um, you, in verse uh, 7, he, he brings up the fact of their history. He says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, that's a pretty good question. And he's asking it rhetorically, but it, is, it, it could cause these Galatians to stop and think, hmm, you know, we, Paul's laid out a pretty good argument here, pretty much unarguable. So stop and think about it, fellas. Who caused you to think wrongly? Wasn't me. Who do you think it might have been? And they're thinking, hmm, yeah, oh, Jeremiah came up here and was preaching that stuff to us and got us all mixed up. I mean, that's what Paul's causing them to think about. Not the Old Testament prophet, obviously, but just some guy had to think of a Jewish name. Uh, so he was as good as any. Uh, says, you did run well. Says, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Who led you astray? It certainly wasn't the Holy Ghost. Hey, think about that. If you were saved by grace through faith, that's what the Holy Ghost told you when you got saved now they knew that I wasn't looking to be saved are you kidding I was an old heathen idol worshiper and this little narrow eyed ball headed short Jew came in and preached and I didn't want to listen to him but something inside said you're going to go to hell you better receive that Jesus that man's talking about who told them that they knew who told them that the Holy Ghost told them that they said hmm, boy that's how I learned the truth so we're this persuasion that you've got that you want to follow the law? Is that what the one who called you said? Did he tell you to live by a set of rules? Had you even heard of a law? When he dealt in your heart? Well, no. The Holy Ghost came, dealt with me. I guess I didn't know anything about the law then. So it, was, it wasn't him that called you. Now, a little leaven in verse 9, leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is used, Jesus used this analogy. Leaven's used in the Old Testament this way, but leaven is something that is out of place religiously. And you know what leaven does? Leaven is not the majority of, of the bread. Most of it is the, is the flour. Okay? But the leaven is just a little something you put in there. But you know what it does? It permeates. It's, it permeates that. It just stays isolated. It permeates that thing, and it causes bread to rise. Leaven is used as an analogy of false doctrine. False doctrine... Most of the time, I, won't, I don't know if this percentage is accurate, but a high percentage of what is being taught in false doctrine is truth. They'll take a lot of truth and mix just a tiny little bit of error with it. Now, some more than others. Some are completely out in left field, but that's not that dangerous. You know, I don't have a whole lot of people struggling today if they want to follow Hinduism. There's some nuts that want to, but I mean, most people... You know, everything's God, the tree's God, the building's God. I mean, most people don't buy that stuff unless they're grown up in it or somebody who's just mixed up and trying to follow something different. The most dangerous stuff is what 90% of it sounds pretty good, but they mix just a little bit of error with it. You say, well, man, 90% of truth, good, wholesome, solid, biblical truth is so good, can a little bit of error mess it up? Well, you take 99% of good, wholesome, solid nice water and mix 1% of arsenic with it and see how it, what it turns into. It turns into 100% poison. Now that's what happens with doctrine. A little bit of leaven spoils the whole thing. You know, people will go into a church and they'll listen to what a guy says and they'll say, well, you know, for the most part he preaches the gospel. That's not enough. You might say a lot of nice things about Jesus and love and be kind to your neighbor and turn the other cheek and the meek shall inherit the earth and all of these wonderful things. But if you're mixed up on the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the inerrancy of the scripture, you're messed up. You can have everything else right. You get those wrong, you've missed it. And he says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
what hinders the liberty I have in Christ? The liberty I have in Christ is going to be hindered by false teaching. We've got to stay true to this book. Now, Paul knew these saved people were going to come out of this. In verse 10, he said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. You know, a truly saved person, eventually when they hear the truth, the Holy Ghost tells them that's the truth. They can get mixed up, and if they don't hear the truth, they can stay mixed up, but when they hear the truth, something inside of them says, yep, that's, that's where I need to go. You know, we've reached people in this, in this church who have who've come in, and they've, they've told me, they said, you know, I was in my church all this time, and I never really felt right there. I didn't even know a church like yours even existed. But as soon as I heard, I came in, I heard what you were preaching, I said, man, that's what I believe. I mean, that's the Holy Spirit. They, he can do that. He can draw you in when you hear. But he said, those that are teaching the stuff, boy, they've got what's coming to them. Their judgment is going to be just. He says in verse 11, And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, now Paul could have. He was more well-versed than the people who came in and taught him this stuff. He used to be in it. He said, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Well, you know, it was very pronounced in the first century. They saw people being thrown to the lions. They saw the persecution. They saw Christians that were dying for the resurrection of Jesus. Here's some people that were willing to go to the, to the death to say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he rose from the dead. I will not recant. I will not turn back. And they stood for it. And these Jews, they could operate. Nobody bothered by them. That's fine. You got these idol worshipers. You got these... Uh, idolaters. Oh, you got these Jews that claim there's one God and they won't eat bacon, but who cares? They're not bothered with us. Um, they didn't bother anybody. I mean, it, there was no persecution, but Paul said, if I wanted to go the easy route, I could. But the offense of the cross, he said, what are they really living for? Well, truly saved people are going to say, you know what? He's got a point there. Truly saved people were going to say, you know, he is standing for Christ and these false teachers. So Paul took a very easy um, avenue with these guys. He tried to go as far as he could and uh, at least give them uh, the credence they deserved as religious doctors and reverends and so forth and said, after all, they're trying to do a lot of good things and, and we all need to come together under one umbrella. And he says in verse 12, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. So in case you didn't uh, pick up on the sarcasm of my previous 30 seconds, what Paul really said was, I would that they were dead. Now, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Paul said, I, it'd be all right with me if that, just, that gang would just go on and bite the dust. I mean, then we'd be a whole lot better off. Now, that's very strong, but that's how much Paul saw them as a danger to the gospel. What a difference than the attitude today. Now, listen, I'm not going to go so far as the Apostle Paul. If I'd have wanted many people to Christ as he had and walk with God like him, I'd say I wish some of this gang was dead. But what I do wish is their influence would be hindered. And I wish that people who knew this book wouldn't compromise with them and get up on the same platform with them and pat them on the back and say, we're all under one big religious umbrella. Listen, I'm not uh, on a mission to, to physically, I wish they'd get saved. That's what I wish, that they'd come to Christ. But I'm not going to give them religious recognition. Paul said, I would, they were cut off, which trouble you. And that's a strong statement because they're hindering what God was trying to do here in this area. So he strongly denounces the false teachers. And then if you'll notice, he goes back to the, belief, to the brethren. He said, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. That's the bottom line. Everything he said in the previous verses, he was trying to make his point, but he said, look, you've been called out of the internment camp of sin. Why would you want to be entangled again in another internment camp of the law? You have been called unto liberty. Now let me just give you this little practical tidbit about liberty. He says, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now, the idea of the flesh is given to us by the context. It says, but by love serve one another. Now, I have been liberated in Christ. I have a personal priesthood, me and Jesus. He can speak to me. I can obey him. I can learn his word. I have liberty. If I fail and I see this book and God teaches me something and I decide I'm not going to do it, 
It isn't going to change the fact that I'm saved that will hinder my spiritual growth. But even something as good as liberty, the old flesh, not the spirit, but the flesh could even take something as good as liberty in Christ. For instance, because we're liberated in Christ, we all chose to come together tonight as a church. We have the joy of being around each other. Nobody made us come. We, we wanted to be here. We might even even thought about staying home because the flesh didn't want to come, but we did. And we, we get something out of it, and that's wonderful. And something as good as the liberty to be able to fellowship with Christians, just one application, even that, what could the flesh do? Well, if I'm going to come anyway, I can't talk him into staying home. At least when I get here, i got to get something out of it, and we still could become selfish. I want to be noticed. I want somebody to see how important I am. Oh, they talk to him and talk to her and talk to her, but I want, them, I want to get the attention. The old flesh always wants to be the center. How do we combat that? By love, serve one another. I have liberty now. You know lost people don't really have liberty to do this. They can do it for whatever motive they might do it, but now in a renewed way, by love, we can serve one another. He's warning them. Don't let liberty be an occasion to the flesh, even something as good as liberty, but by love serve one another. For after all, verse 14, the law is fulfilled in one word even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You know, what was happening with these false teachers is these false teachers inevitably were coming in and they weren't producing a loving, liberated group of people. They were producing a biting and devouring. Look how many laws I'm able to keep. Look how many laws I'm able to keep. I mean, look how good I am at being a Jew. Look how good, boy, I've, I've got, I've, I've, you know, people could have, had become proud and arrogant even in their religion. And that's what that legalistic lack of liberty produced in them. But he says, you've been called unto liberty. Don't let it happen. Live by the law of love. Now, we're going to stop there tonight. The second part of this chapter is going to tell us how we can have power in a practical way to see liberty work out in our life. So we're going to stop there tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we have been liberated. And Lord, there is no doubt in the day that Galatians lived, there were religious charlatans that tried to hinder and tried to uh, spy out these Christians and tried to pull them out of the liberty they had in Jesus. May we today look not to religion, but to the power of this book with a heart to do what it says and to seek the grace of God to to have power to do what it says, that we might be a testimony for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 407, all the way my Savior leads me. We're going to stand, sing that first stanza, and then we'll be dismissed.